From the PEN studios, this is the Imperfect Moms Club with your hosts, Lisa and Brittany. On today's episode of Imperfect, Brittany offers great advice for setting your child up for success in the coming school year. Hey guys, how's it going? So today we're talking about back to school. It's one of my favorite times of year, but also one of the most hectic times of year for me. If you don't know, I teach kindergarten, and so I am actually preparing for back to school a couple months before the rest of you guys are, doing things like a classroom setup and classroom themes and going through curriculum and planning out the school year. I really enjoy it. It's one of my biggest passions ever, but it's a lot. (laughs) So I thought today would be the perfect day to do a back to school episode with you all, setting up your child for success, talking about some things that your child's teacher wishes that you knew. Also some just some basic back to school tips that I can share from a teacher's perspective and from a parent's perspective. And near the end of the episode, I'm going to be talking about drop-offs, about the dreaded drop-off, like literally when you're trying to let your kid just go to class and the teacher is holding on to them and your little child is just like hanging on the door frame with their fingernails and screaming at you to take them home. I'm going to be talking about that and how to get through that. I've seen it on more than one occasion, okay? (laughs) So we're gonna be doing some things with that. All right, so let's jump into it. Setting up your child for success at school. First and foremost, and you're gonna roll your eyes at me, and that's okay, make sure your child is on a good sleep schedule. I know, it's basic, and it's like, duh. But for real, like, please, please, please make sure your child is on a good sleep schedule. You can't expect your child to have a great day at school if they're tired and grouchy. Let me promise you that drop-off is going to be a absolute nightmare. And like I said, we're going to talk about what to do about clinging kids today. I promise we will get to that. But the first thing you got to do is make sure that they have a good sleep schedule, that they are rested and that they are at their best physically. Your child will not be ready to learn and they're probably going to have a really hard time interacting with their fellow classmates and with your teachers. Just think about how you feel when you've been up three or four times a night trying to help take care of the kids or if someone has a potty accident in the middle of the night and that interrupts your sleep cycle and you have to get up and change the bed sheets and throw things in the wash and clean up and all of that. You know how groggy you can be in the morning and how you don't can kind of not set yourself up for success necessarily at the beginning of the day. So think of that before a child and children need a lot more sleep than we honestly think that they do. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I know it's been summertime. It's been break. Also, I don't know what your personal school year has looked like last year, but if you've been virtual, it's possible that your child hasn't had a regular sleep cycle in a long time because There's not necessarily a school bus to get to in the morning. You can sleep in and you don't have to be on Zoom until 930 or whatever. So everything's been thrown out of whack and we've had summer break and kids have been staying up late and having bonfires and catching fireflies and all of those things are great and they're awesome. But now we have to get back on a schedule. So if you have a three to five year old, they are recommending that they get 11 to 13 hours of sleep. I know you heard that number 11 to 13 hours and you're like, how the heck am I supposed to make that happen? Well, that's not all in one shot. This also counts nap time. So if they don't get their 11 to 13 hours of sleep in one night, have them try and go down for a nap in the afternoon or maybe, I don't know, they can nap in the car on the way to school. I don't know. (laughs) But just generally, that's generally what we're aiming for is, is 11 to 13 hours of sleep. Uh, 6 to 12 years old, they need 9 to 12 hours of sleep. And then teenagers and up, it's anywhere from 8 to 10 hours of sleep. So we've all read the articles. We've all heard the things from the pediatricians. You're supposed to put the screens away a few hours before bed and do some quiet things. Personally, this is something I very much struggle with. If you're a mom too, you know that... Once the kids and hubby go down for 
bed and like the house is nice and quiet like that is my time and it is so precious to me <laughs> like nobody's touching me nobody needs a snack I don't have to help anyone go potty it can just be me and so I am on my phone I'm watching a show I'm listening to a podcast I'm scrolling I'm doing something on my phone half the time I'm also like folding laundry at the same time but I know I struggle with that personally but for our kids and for our teenagers, a couple hours before they're going to be going down to bed, try and minimize the screen time. Have them color, have them read a book, or just play a, a board game. I feel like we don't play board games very much anymore. My daughter personally loves playing Guess Who. She, <laughs> she, she always gives away a little too much information. Like, does your person have blonde hair? Nope, they have black hair, and it's in a braid, and they're wearing glasses. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Clara, <laughs> you're giving me too much information. But have them just do something quiet, not necessarily be on a screen right before bedtime. Try as, as best you can, stick to a bedtime routine. It can be as simple as you need it to be or as complicated as you need it to be. Just have some sort of routine so that you know, okay, once you get started, you know what the next steps are gonna be. Like for my girls, I say, okay, it's time to go put your jammies on. So they know, pick up whatever it is that they're playing with to run to their room, put on their pajamas, and they just automatically know, okay, the next step is to brush my teeth. And then the step after, after that is to get a glass of water, and then they jump into bed, and then we do um, stories on our Alexa, our Amazon Alexa. You can tell it to read Disney stories, or sometimes I'll have her read a children's audiobook, something like that to the kids. Um, or my husband will read them a book too. And then we turn that off, we turn on some music and then they go to bed. So our routine is pretty simple, but the kids know when I say, okay, pajama time, they know what all the next steps are gonna be. So have some sort of routine to help the kids and just help everything flow more uh, fluidly and smoothly. Second thing to set your kids up for success at school is to acknowledge their fears. So going to school can be scary, and it can be especially scary if it's their first time. If you're just now bringing someone to preschool or this is their first introduction to school and they're going to first grade or kindergarten or whatever, they've never been in a school before, that can be scary, okay? It's a big building, there's lots of hallways, and there's different noises, there's uh, a bell that rings every 45 minutes. Like, it, it, it can be scary. So your kids are little people and they have big feelings and they need your help to process the feelings and how to manage your feelings. I don't like it when parents just say, oh no, you're not scared, or oh, don't be scared, or oh, don't do that. Okay, listen, they have the feeling. Acknowledge the feeling is there, all right? It's an emotion, and whether or not you want to acknowledge it, it's there, whether you like it or not. So let's teach kids how to manage that feeling. We're all gonna be scared at some point in our lives. We're all gonna be anxious. We're all gonna be angry. We're all gonna be sad. It's very natural to have those feelings and just pushing them aside and bottling them up doesn't do anything except make the problem worse. So acknowledge their feeling of yes, they're feeling anxious, but what are we gonna do with this feeling? How are we gonna get through this? Let's not get paralyzed by our feelings. Let's work through them. So when they say, I don't wanna go to school or I'm scared, like right now, my daughter is going into first grade and she's really concerned because she doesn't know how to do cursive. And I keep telling her, it's okay, it's all right, you don't, we'll get through it. So when those things come up, acknowledge it and say, hey, it's okay to feel that way. I understand you're feeling anxious or I understand you're a little nervous about that. Everybody gets nervous or scared sometimes. But this is, a, this is a great classroom and your teacher is gonna take such good care of you. You're gonna meet so many new friends who like the same things as you like. And it's okay if you don't know how to read yet or how to do cursive yet or fill in the blank. That's why you get to go to school. You get to learn new and exciting things and I'm gonna come back and pick you up after and I'm gonna hear all about your exciting day. Say something to that effect, acknowledging the fear, but then saying, here's all these really great things that also come with school. It's this big package, okay? Yes, you're gonna be separated from mommy and daddy for a few hours, and that's part of it. But look at all these other good things 
that are also going to happen. And then always reassure them, mommy's going to pick you up after, or daddy's going to pick you up after, or grandma, grandpa, aunt Susie, whoever. Reassure them, we are coming back to get you, and then I can't wait to hear all about your day. And when you pick them up, ask them about their day. Ask them specifically. Don't just say, what'd you learn today? I don't know. Oh my word. I hate when they always say nothing. I'm like, what? I planned all these lesson plans and we did science experiments and songs and books. What do you mean we did nothing all day? (laughs) So be a little more specific and say like, what was your favorite thing you did today? What was your least favorite thing you did today? Who did you sit next to at lunch? Be very specific. (laughs) And then the conversation hopefully will just start to flow out of them. So have you ever heard somebody tell you, oh, don't worry about it. Or don't be sad. And you're like, oh, wow. Thanks, man. You just cured me. Okay, seriously. Sometimes you just need your feelings to be heard and you just need to be validated and giving some encouragement. And the same thing goes for kids. Don't just brush it off because they're little. They are real people with real feelings. And this is the foundation that we're laying down here is how to manage these feelings. There are also some really great books that I want to recommend to you leading up to school. The first one is called The Night Before Preschool by Natasha Wing. The second book is called The Night Before Kindergarten by Natasha Wing. The third one is called The Night Before First Grade by Natasha Wing. (laughs) I promise the other two are different. But those are some really great books to start off with. And she has a fabulous, fabulous series of The Night Before. And it rhymes and the illustrations are just so cute. I love it. Uh, Fourth book is called If You Bring a Mouse to School by Laura Numeroff. And the last book I want to recommend is called What Should Danny Do School Day? And I know I'm going to butcher this. I'm so sorry, but this is written by Adir Levi and Gannett Levi. This last book, What Should Danny Do School Day, is a choose your own adventure book. And it is the coolest book ever. My kids at home absolutely love reading it. My kids at school absolutely love reading it. I even let our high school teacher use it in her English class one day because she just didn't really have anything to do. And I'm like, you've got to read your kids this book. I know they're high schoolers, but they'll love it. And they totally loved it. So Danny wakes up and he needs to get ready for school. And he has to decide if he's going to listen to his mom and come down for breakfast right away or if he's going to keep playing. And depending on what your child chooses for Danny to do, you flip to page 23 or page 14, and then you continue throughout the book and you choose your own adventure and his school day goes well or not so well, depending on the choices that Danny picks. And you can have like eight different endings or something like that in this book. It's fantastic. I love it. And um, I think your kids would love it too. So these are just a few of my favorite books. There's so many more. And one thing I like to do if I can is I like to switch the main character's name for my child's name. So the girls love it when I do that. We did this for Clara when we found out we were going to have Molly. I got her a book that was called I'm a Big Sister or something like that. And the little girl's name in the book was Sarah. But I just said Clara instead. And she thought that was awesome. So the girls love that because it makes them feel like they're in the story. So if you can do that, your kids are going to think that's pretty cool. All right, number three, set your kids up for success for the school year. Please attend the parent orientation, the kindergarten orientation, or whatever the back to school event is. Please attend. Even if you have a dozen kids and this is your 13th time going to kindergarten orientation, please go. (laughs) If not for you, Go for your child. They need to feel special too. Just because they're on the tail end of it doesn't mean that their orientation is any less important than your first child's orientation. Please go. Your kids are going to feel so much better when they've had a chance to see their physical classroom, meet their teacher face to face. They'll get to see where the bathrooms are. They're going to see where to hang their jackets, where to hang their backpacks. And getting a little preview of what's to come can definitely help kids feel less anxious. Bring them into the building. Meet their teacher. (laughs) Please go. Your teachers 
and principal administrator, we work so hard on these days and when no one shows up, it is so discouraging. So take a minute to meet their teacher, walk them around, get to know their teacher and find out what's the best way to stay in contact. Do they like to email? Do they text? Do they call? Is there a private Facebook page for the parents? Just go ahead and ask. A lot of times teachers will have a meet the teacher page that they pass out and it has all of their information on there. Just find out what's the best way to stay in contact with your teacher because everybody does it differently. Now I've learned over the years that I just try to do a little bit of everything because some parents like to text and some parents like to Facebook message. And so I try and hit everything, but find out what's the best way to stay in contact with your teacher. And it's okay if your child is shy at this first meeting, okay? There's no judgment here. I, I'm, I'm telling you, the teacher has seen it all, okay? She's not judging you. <laughs> and going to school, it's like, it's a big kid thing. And it can be a really big step for them to take. If a child is feeling a little bit out of his element, you would expect him to hang back a little bit and maybe act a little bit of a little shy because he's out of his element. He doesn't feel completely comfortable. So I would not force any child to hug their teacher or say anything. If they don't want to say hi, that's okay. It's okay. Just read their body language and just go from there. Don't don't make them more uncomfortable than they might already be feeling. It's just going to make it uncomfortable for everybody. I hate it when people are like, oh, give Miss Brittany a hug. And then they're like, no. <laughs> and then they like grab their mom's leg and hide. I, I don't know what to do in that situation. <laughs> I'm just kind of standing there awkwardly. So let's just not put anyone in that awkward situation. If they want to be standoffish, that's, that is okay. It, your teacher is not going to judge you for that. Um, so walk your kid around the room, point out all the cool things that they're going to get to interact with, make them feel comfortable, be excited because your kid is going to feed off of what you uh, give off of energy. And even if they still seem incredibly shy and scared, you walking around the room with them and reassuring them and saying, wow, look at all these cool books and look at this comfortable couch you're going to get to sit on. And oh my goodness, this is where you're going to hang all your artwork. I can't wait to see what you're going to make. They're going to feed off of that energy and it's just going to reassure them. All right, number four. Some of you are going to hate me for this. You got to get organized you have got to get organized, please. I'm not saying that you need to have a Pinterest perfect mud room with labeled hooks for each child and like custom built cubbies, although that is very awesome and they're all over Instagram and Pinterest. They're not necessary. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. If you're going to be to school on time and everyone is going to have eaten a good breakfast and they're going to be dressed... <laughs> And they're going to have everything they need for the day, like their sneakers for PE class or their project for science. You have got to get yourself organized. First thing I recommend, pack your lunch boxes the night before. If you have older children, teach them how to pack their own lunch boxes. Take a little bit of that load off of you, but pack them the night before. So personally, I used to do this right after dinner. I would divide up all the leftovers between the lunch boxes, and I already had the cutting board out, so chopping up some little cheese squares or vegetables, it was no big deal. I already had everything out. If I had a toddler who I knew wouldn't eat uh, meatloaf for lunch the next day, I already had all my dishes out. I would just boil up some noodles or something and throw it into our lunch box right then and there. And so it saved on dishes and it saved on time. And I was able to kill two birds with one, so one stone, so to speak. So do that the night before. If you have limited space in your refrigerator, what I recommend doing is putting everything in the lunchbox that does not need to be refrigerated. Granola bars, juice boxes, apples, oranges, whatever. And then everything else that needs to be refrigerated, keep in the refrigerator, but keep it in its own like little, like a little pod almost. Like I make a little stack of my husband's leftovers. And so he'll, I'll have his leftovers and then like his yogurt and then, I don't know, whatever else is going in his lunchbox that day that needs to be refrigerated. And it's in its own little stack and its own little pot. And same thing for me and for my daughter. And so in the morning, I just grab those, I throw them in the lunchbox that's already been prepped the night before and I throw an ice pack in there. 
Bada bing, bada boom, you're done. Have a designated place for backpacks, your gym bags, and your shoes. So our spot is right by the door, and I make sure that our bags are packed the night before. This is just going to have to become part of your nightly routine. I know it seems like a pain, you're tired, you just want to sit down, but I'm telling you, your morning's going to go so much smoother if you just take a couple extra minutes to make sure these things are ready. So no matter your child's age, it doesn't hurt to have a spare outfit, including underwear, packed away in their bag. Okay, I, I know that preschool age, we kind of think of this as common sense to have an extra outfit in case there's a potty accident or in case the ketchup bottle explodes at school. I don't know. But even for up to a high school student, have just an extra outfit packed away just in case because you just you never know. You know, someone might spill something or they might fall in a puddle. I don't know. Just have that. It's helpful. Better safe than sorry. So make sure all your backpacks and things are packed away and they're over there by the door and they're ready to go and that everyone has their book report in there. All of their papers are signed. It's ready to go. Next is get a refrigerator calendar. So I used to have this really big magnet one and it was a dry erase board and I kept it on the refrigerator and every month I would sit down and I would write out all of the events school breaks, appointments, and I did this religiously, okay? I would sit there, it'd probably take me 20 minutes or so, but it just kept everything flowing well. It kept everyone on the same page. And I liked having it right in the kitchen because that was just kind of like our command center, I guess. So if anyone needed to know what was going on, they could just walk over and see what's up. If I was on the phone and uh, someone from church was like, hey, we want to have a play date or whatever. I could just glance over at my calendar and say, okay, I'm free this day, this day, or this day. And it was just nice to know when the school breaks were coming up and all of that. And it, it was just right there in the command center. Everyone knew what was going on. So have one big calendar where you write everything major down. Soccer games, big book reports, field trips. You got to have one of those. Next is you have to set your alarms, okay? Aim to get out the door a little bit early, okay? You never know if you're going to run into traffic on the way to school. Uh, maybe you're going to have to turn around because Samantha forgot her lunchbox on the counter. Give yourself some wiggle room, okay? This is going to take some discipline and it's probably going to take some practice for some of you, but I'm telling you, your life will be so much less stressful if you plan to give yourself some wiggle room. So give yourself some time in case you have to turn around, in case you are running late, okay? School is going to start on time whether or not your child is there. Work is going to start on time whether or not you're there, and you guys will be a lot less stressed running around, like not running around, frantically yelling at each other if you are to give yourself some wiggle room and get out the door a little bit early. And you know what? Say you get like really good at it and you are constantly dropping the kids off early at school, like five or 10 minutes early. Give yourself like a nice little coffee treat after you drop them off. Drive through the Dunkin' or the Starbucks or whatever and grab yourself a coffee as like a little high five to yourself. Good job. All right, that was a lot of information. I think it's time we take a very quick commercial break. And when we come back, I'm going to share some things that your child's teacher wants you to know. The Imperfect Moms Club is brought to you by... That, huh? So they just magically showed up. I mean, literally, I just opened the door and they were there. I ordered them, honey. Oh! We are very happy with our new Casper. The comfort is like a Lucius cloud, one of the softer clouds. But it's also a firm cloud, like a Aratio cloud. Always want to be a weatherman. Guess who I am? It's the most exciting thing that's happened in our bedroom in a long time. A long time. Right? I was on the fence about changing from a manual to an electric toothbrush, but my hygienist said going electric could lead to way cleaner teeth. She said get the one inspired by dentists with the round brush head. Go pro with Oral-B. Oral-B's gentle rounded brush head removes more plaque along the gum line for cleaner teeth and healthier gums. And unlike Sonicare, Oral-B is the first electric toothbrush brand accepted by the ADA for its effectiveness and safety. What an amazing clean. I'll only use an Oral-B. 
Oral-B. Brush like a pro. This is the Imperfect Moms Club on PEN. Get in touch with the show through the PEN listener hotline at 833-PODSNET. That's 833-763-7638. And now, back to the Imperfect Moms Club on the Podcast Entertainment Network. Welcome back. We've gone over how we can set up our kids for success, and now we're going to share some things that your child's teacher probably wants you to know. So I'm going to share these things um, by saying them in the first person because I am a teacher. I'm actually going into my 10th year this year. It's crazy. I feel like I just got out of college. <laughs> I, I, I'm going into my 10th year. That's pretty cool. I have definitely experienced a lot of these things firsthand. So I'm not saying that each of these are personally my own things, but these are things, some of these I have experienced and um, other teachers have experienced them too. So number one. I am probably just as nervous as you are, and that's not a bad thing. I just I just want the school year to go well. I've been working for months throughout the summer on my theme. I've been putting the classroom together meticulously over the past several weeks, and I've been preparing for each student with every name tag that I write. I've researched new good morning songs. I've organized my curriculum, and I'm ready. I'm excited, and I'm nervous, too. And that's okay. I'm getting a brand new group of kids and it's going to take a few weeks for us to get used to each other. I can tell you as a teacher throughout the year, I get so attached to my students. I call them my kids. I just, I love them so much. I, I think about them all the time. I spend so much time with them. I just, I love them. And then every year I have to say goodbye and I hate it. I just, I get so attached to these little monkeys and I just, I hate saying goodbye knowing they're going to go off to another classroom and be someone else's kid and someone else's student. And I'm like, every year the same thing happens. I look at them and I'm like, I'm never going to love a class the same way I've loved you guys. You guys have been so special to me. And I just, I'm, I don't say that to them, but I think I'm like, I'm never going to love anyone else. I never will. You know, Miss Drama Queen over here. But then the next group comes and I fall in love all over again. But yeah, I'm nervous because it's a whole new group of kids. They all have their own little personalities and their own little quirks and they're growing and they're changing. And once you figure something out, they completely morph and they completely switch and develop and they change and you have to figure it all out all over again. I'm also nervous because I have a whole new set of parents that I'm going to be dealing with, and I'm hoping that you're a nice parent, okay? I've had to deal with all of the different varieties of parents, and let me tell you that sometimes the parents are the most stressful part of the job. Like, I will hang out with 24 two-year-olds all day long. I will clean up boogers and poop and pee all day long, but sometimes the parents are the worst part of the job, so I'm nervous about who you are as a person. So please be kind, <laughs> okay? We'll get into a little bit more, but I'm nervous because of all those things. I'm also just trying to do a really good job this year. You know, I want your kid to succeed as much as you want them to succeed. So we're all nervous. <laughs> Everybody is nervous. Number two, something that your teacher probably wants you to know is your child is not my only student. And I know that seems kind of like common sense, but some parents kind of need to know that is your child is not my only student. And I understand your child is the center of your world. And that is exactly how it should be. Okay. They are your whole world. That is your baby. Okay. That is okay. And that's how it should be. But you have to understand that I have a whole classroom of kids and I will give as much time and attention and love to each kid as much as I can. But unless you are hiring a private tutor, I'm going to have to balance and divvy up my time in between all of these students. It doesn't mean that I think one student is more important than another or less important or more special or less special. I just have to evaluate each child's needs accordingly and that might change from day to day. It can change from minute to minute. And I might end up spending more time with one student versus another student. 
it's just the way the game is played. It doesn't mean I don't love your child any less or any more or whatever, <laughs> okay? It's the same thing if you have multiple children. You love them all unconditionally, all the same, but sometimes somebody needs a little more attention than somebody else. I promise I will assess each student needs and I will divide my time up accordingly. And also just remember, just like you have things that you have to take care of at home, such as cooking and cleaning and laundry and shuttling kids to and from appointments, I also have a lot of responsibilities. You and I both wear a lot of hats. We are both fantastic multitaskers, okay? So just remember that we're all trying to do our best here. Number three, I am on your team. If I have to bring something up to you concerning your child and it's kind of uncomfortable, trust me, I am not trying to judge you or make you feel like a bad parent. I'm not trying to belittle you and be like, oh, well, I'm a teacher and I've had 10 years experience and blah, blah, blah. I can't believe that Jonathan doesn't know how to put his suspenders back on. I don't know. Kids don't even wear suspenders anymore unless they're at a wedding. But I'm not here to judge you. Okay, I'm not here to make you feel bad. And the thing is, I've worked with a lot of kids over the years. And yes, while each student is totally unique and totally special, sometimes I can pick up right away when a kid is not headed in quite the right direction and we need to both work together as a team to make a change, okay? I'm not judging you. I'm not saying that you're a bad parent. I'm just noticing that a certain child is struggling in an area, okay? And we are a team and we can work together to help them succeed. That is that is the only goal I have here, is not to make parents feel bad, but is to help each student succeed, is to lay down the foundation so that the next year they're prepared and lay up all that scaffolding for them, so to speak, so that when I take the scaffolding away, they are able to stand on their own and succeed and thrive. And sometimes one student is going to need a little more scaffolding than another. And that is perfectly okay. That is fine and normal. I am not an adversary, okay? I'm on the same side as you, and all I want is for your child to succeed. So just keep an open mind, and let's just have a conversation. That's all it is. Number four, I spend a lot of my own money on my class, and I'm not saying this for you to feel sorry for me. That's not where I'm going here. I never went into teaching for the money, okay? That's not why I got into this, but I just want you to understand how much love and thought goes into my classroom. It's not just throwing money at decorations or throw pillows. Sometimes I end up buying school supplies or sometimes even food for the kids. Okay, and I, I do it quietly. I do it, like I, I am more than happy. If I am able to provide and just quietly give somebody a snack when I know that they don't have a snack, I'm more than happy to do that. I don't need a parade. I don't need a certificate, a big thank you card. That's why I'm here, is to help take care of your kids. Sometimes I buy clothes or books for students and I spend a lot of my time where I'm not on the clock, I'm not getting paid, and I spend a lot of my own money on my students. I love them and that's why I do it. And I just want you to know that so you understand how invested some of these teachers are. Like we are spending so much of our life, our time, when we could be out with our families or could be out with our friends. Instead, you'll find us in our classrooms, rearranging and putting up posters. When we could be hanging out with uh, our bestie and buying a fancy coffee and cinnamon roll, we're instead taking that money and we're making sure that Jonathan has a lunch today, okay? We are more than happy to do that. But I just want you to know how invested we are. And if you wanna do something really nice for a teacher, don't buy her another mug. And you know what, I love mugs. I'm always buying mugs. So actually putting that down in my notes today was like a little bit like tr sad for me because. I love a good mug, but I've got so many mugs. I have so many. Don't buy her another mug, okay? She doesn't need a basket of lotion and soap. I'm sorry, that's like one of the worst gifts you can give somebody is like those bath things. It's like, here's some lotion and some shampoo. You stink. Like, please don't give them that, okay? 
whatever you would have spent on the mug or the soap, even if it's like five bucks, all right, just give her a gift card to Target or Amazon or just give her the cash. Just give her five bucks. She's going to make that stretch in a way that only a teacher can. All right, the last thing that your teacher probably wants you to know, you are your child's first and most important teacher. I'm going to say that one more time. You are your child's first and most important teacher. It might seem like I have them for most of their waking hours, and that very well might be true, but I only have them for the school year. You've had them for their entire lives so far, and you are their most important teacher. I can teach them their ABCs and 123s, but you can teach them so much more and they need you. You can teach them how to love, how to develop real and meaningful relationships. You can teach them to have a great work ethic and never give up. You can teach them how to be respectful and how to stick up for one another. You can teach them how to make mistakes and get back up again. You can teach them how to make their beds, tie their shoes, and brush their hair. You can leave a legacy behind, and like all the t-shirts and all the mugs say, Raise good humans. I might have them for a few hours a day, but you have them for the rest of their lives. Please make it count. All right, one more thing I wanted to say here. I don't have this in my notes, so I'm not exactly sure how this is going to go. I might ramble. So sorry. <laughs> but if you get a first year teacher, don't feel like you got the short end of the stick with that. I know that you think, oh, she's a first year. Oh, he's a first year. They don't have the experience, you know. Well, you know, And that's true. There is a lot that comes with experience. There's a lot of things that I know now going into my 10th year teaching that I wish I had known my first year. But there's something special about a first year teacher, and that is the energy that they bring I absolutely love working alongside first year teachers because even though I'm very bubbly and I have a bright personality and I like to bounce around the classroom and act silly with my kids, I get really tired and I can get discouraged and I've got two kids of my own now and so I don't always get a full eight hours of sleep, you know? So Working alongside a first-year teacher is just so invigorating. It's like someone stuck a Gatorade in an IV and, like, jammed it in my veins. It's awesome. They have so much energy and new ideas, and they're fresh out of college, and it's wonderful. It's a wonderful experience. Yes, it's going to be different than working alongside a teacher who has 40-plus years experience and who's raising grandbabies and all of this. There, there is something special that comes along with experience. But if you get a first-year teacher this year, do not be discouraged. Don't scoff at it. That is a blessing in its own way. And again, every teacher is going to be different. So don't think just because you got your first-year teacher that Miss Johnson down the hall, who's got 20-plus years experience, would be any better for your child. You've been placed in that classroom for a reason. That's the girl or the guy you've been given. Take it and make the most of it. Make them feel loved. And don't let your kids think that their teacher is any less of a teacher just because of how many years that they've had. Make sure that when you're talking about your teacher in front of your kids, it's with respect. Okay? Because when the children come into a classroom and they don't, think that their parents respect their teacher, they're not going to respect them either. And that just makes our, our job 10 times harder. If you are having like a legitimate issue with your teacher, make sure you're discussing that privately. Bring in the administrator if you need to, but don't ever, ever do any of that in front of the kids because it just really makes our job so much harder. But I remember being scoffed at a little bit my first year teaching, and I remember coming up with all these awesome ideas I wanted to do with the kids, and these older generations would look at me and just like, oh, well, you know, you can totally tell she's new because look at all these ideas she has. But it was great. It was awesome. I had so much energy. I had so many new things to try and new technologies that I was aware of, it wasn't a bad thing. And you know what? We all got to start somewhere. So 
Sorry, I thought it was a little bit rambly. Like I said, that one wasn't in my notes, but I really wanted to put that in there. We're going to take another quick break, and I promise, I promise, 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 when we come back, I'm going to talk about what to do when you have a super clingy kindergartner or first grader or whatever, and they won't let you leave, and they're just screaming <laughs> the top of their lungs, Mommy, don't leave me! <laughs> We're going to talk about that when we come back. Now, a word from our sponsors. Imagine a world where potty training is fun, fast, and easy. Only pull-ups have Disney graphics that fade when wet to teach big kids to stay dry. So they're motivated to keep the music going. I'm a big kid now. Chris, come and turn the TV, turn your house into a... You like your drinks, nice and cold, but the sensitive tea thing is getting old. Yeah. Time to say bye. Goodbye to the pain, cause having sensitive teeth teeth is just so lame. Press gum and sensitivity turns your house into ah. Hey! 80% of sensitivity starts at the gum line. Treat it at the source with Crest Gum and Sensitivity. Crest, healthy, beautiful smiles for life. No matter what all the baby experts say, the perfect way to care for your baby is your own way. And that inspired our perfect diaper to be the softest ever with plant-based materials. Huggy Special Delivery. Want to get in touch with the show? Email us at imperfect at podcastentertainment.com. And now, back to the Imperfect Moms Club on the Podcast Entertainment Network. Welcome back, everybody. It's the moment you've all been waiting for. How to deal with your child when they are being so clingy at school drop-off or preschool drop-off or daycare and they just don't want you to leave and they're screaming the little hearts out. What do you do? How do you handle it? Well, like I said, I'm going into my 10th year of teaching and I've got some tips and tricks for you. Here we go. So first thing you're going to do is create a routine. So every morning you're going to wake up going to have breakfast, brush your teeth, get dressed, listen to the same Disney playlist while you're brushing their hair. I don't know. Create your little routine, grab your backpack, lunchbox, hop in the car, and get driving over to school. As you're doing all this, you need to talk your kid through it. Okay, it's time to wake up. All right, now it's time for breakfast. All right, I need you to go brush your teeth. And now we're gonna hop in the car and we're gonna be at school in 15 minutes. Give them a countdown. All right, we're gonna be at school in five minutes. And then tell them what to expect. I don't know what your personal school's drop-off policy is. I don't know if you drop them off at the door or if they hop out of the car at a drop-off line. I don't know if you walk into the classroom, but whatever the routine is, whatever the policy is, talk your kid through it, all right? In just a couple minutes, we're gonna pull up. You're gonna hop out of the car. I love you, and I'll be back at whatever time. If your child is too young to understand time, such as 2.45 or Maybe it's a half day, so you pick them up at 12.30. Tell them, I'm going to pick you up right after lunch, or I'll pick you up right after PE today. Use vocabulary and terminology that they're going to understand, because your five-year-old is probably not going to understand what 2.45 means, but they know what it means after PE class or after music class. Reassure them you will come and you will pick them up. Pay attention. Okay, sometimes kids are totally faking. <laughs> we all did it as we were children. I can remember faking being sick because I didn't want to go to my piano lesson. Okay, pay attention. Do they really have a tummy ache? Do they really have a headache? Or are they just being anxious? Give them a drink of water. Let their teacher know and say, hey, if you don't feel better in an hour or whatever time frame you want to stamp on it, have the teacher call me or I'll check in on you. And actually do check in on them. I've had parents do that. 
where they actually will text me 30 minutes in or 45 minutes in and say, hey, are they okay? And most of the time they are. Most of the time the kids are totally fine. They're not complaining of any discomfort and they're perfectly fine. But maybe they aren't feeling well that morning. So just pay attention and try and evaluate if they really do need a Tylenol, if they really do need a stay-at-home day, or if they're just being a little bit anxious. Do say goodbye. Don't just drop and run. Don't throw them in the room and run off. Give them a real goodbye. Don't drag it out. (laughs) It doesn't need to be a 10-minute thing. This isn't a TV drama series. (laughs) Give them a hug and reassurance and say, hey, I love you. You're going to have a great day and I'll be back later. And then you have to turn and leave. They might scream. They might cry. They might chase after you. But just turn and leave. Leave and stay gone, please. (laughs) This is one of the worst things you can do is to say goodbye. Leave. And then come right back because you hear them screaming. I've had a parent leave and then they literally came back like three minutes later and then the cycle started all over again. You're not helping your child with separation if you come right back. I promise you if there's something terribly wrong, the teacher will contact you. Okay. She will get a hold of you if something is terribly wrong. But 99% of the time... The kids are perfectly fine within five minutes of you being out of sight. I promise. I know your mommy heart is just bursting at the seams and you are just fighting every urge to just turn around and run and pick up your little one and never bring them back to school ever again. I know. And the kids know too. They know how to push all of your buttons They know how to play your heartstrings, and they're going to pull on every one of those strings if they don't want to be at school that day. But you know that they are safe. It's a good school. It's a good teacher. It's a good environment. And just walk out and don't come back until it's time for pickup. Coming right back is going to make them even more anxious than before. And then they're not going to know what to expect. They're not going to know what the quote-unquote rules are. The rules of the game are, I have breakfast at home, I get dressed and ready, we hop in the car, I go to school, mom leaves, I do school, mom comes back, or dad comes back, or big brother picks me up, whatever it is. Keep it consistent, don't change the game, let them know what the rules are. Again, use their vocabulary, don't tell them I'm going to be back at 2.45 or I'm going to be back after my meeting or blah, blah, blah. Use a term or an event that they will completely understand, especially if they're a younger child. If you're leaving them at daycare for a half day, say, hey, I'm going to pick you up right after lunch or I'm going to come get you right after nap time. Use that sort of terminology with them and then stick to it. If you're running late, it's really nice to let your teacher know so that she can tell the child. If I had a child at daycare who consistently got picked up, say, at 1 o'clock, and then for some reason their parent was going to come at 4 o'clock, which is a very significant time frame difference, it was really helpful for me to know. And then I could tell the child, hey, mom's running late today, so your Aunt Susan's going to come get you at 4 o'clock today. They just like to know what's going on because if they're used to getting picked up at one certain time and then all of a sudden you don't show up and they don't know what's going on, that can make them feel very anxious and that can make drop off the next day even harder. Another thing you can do is practice being apart. I know this can be difficult during the COVID years that we're going through, but if you can drop them off with a family member or a babysitter and have them practice not being with you 24-7, that will be good for them. And again, a quick goodbye. It doesn't need to be a long, drawn-out event. A goodbye, a hug, reassurance that you're coming back, and then leave. And then come back in an hour or two hours or whatever it is that you're going to be gone for. This is going to take practice. 
and it could take you a couple weeks to get into it. But I promise if you stay consistent, it will get easier for you. It will get easier for your child and it will get easier for the teacher as well. You can expect some kind of regression after holidays or really long breaks or if there's something new going on in the family, say a new baby or someone's moving in or someone's moving out or whatever, expect a little bit of regression just as you would expect for eating and sleeping and possibly potty training. It's just going to take time and it's going to be take practice. Just keep at it. You've got this. Wow. Okay, so that was a lot of information. Let's do a quick little recap, especially since we had a really big segment at the beginning. Let's do a quick recap, talk about how to set our kids up for success, and then we'll be on our way. First and foremost, make sure your child is on a good sleep schedule. This is one of their most basic needs. Your kids need to have enough sleep. They need to have enough food in their bellies and they need to feel loved and safe. If you can nail all of those things, you're basically set up for success. But please make sure you're getting them enough sleep at night before a big school day. Second, acknowledge their feelings. We are laying the foundations for kids to learn how to manage all of their feelings. It's incredibly natural for a human being to feel happy or sad or angry or scared or all of these feelings are just incredibly natural. They just happen. But how do you manage that? How do you keep that under control? How do you stay disciplined? Acknowledge that the feeling is there. Don't just push it away and pretend it's not there. Acknowledge its existence and then show your kids how to manage. Give them the tools that they need for success. This isn't only going to help them in their school years, it's going to help them into their adult years as well. Number three, I say this for every school administrator across America, please attend the parent orientation meetings. <laughs> Your administrators and teachers are working so hard and we set these meetings up just for you, just for the parents and the kids, if it's like an open house situation. This is your time to get to know the teachers, to know your administrator, to get your handbooks, all of your information and forms that you're going to need for the year. Please attend the meetings. Even if this is your seventh kindergartner, please go. They are not any less important than your first kindergartner. If you can bring your child, Please bring your child, help them get familiar with the building and with their classroom and just show them how excited you are for their new journey into school. Number four is get organized. I know this is going to be a hard one and you're going to have to stay really disciplined. I think I read somewhere it takes 21 days to create a habit. So buckle down, girlfriend, because you're going to be spending about the first month trying to get organized and trying to get your routine down, okay? <laughs> Especially after having a really nice long summer with your kids. But get organized. Set up your system for the backpacks and the lunch boxes and the gym shoes and your little routine so that your mornings just flow smoothly without any issues. All right, we also talked about things that your child's teacher probably wants you to know. And let me just remind you, She's probably just as nervous as you are, okay? Everyone is nervous on the first day of school, even the administrator. Everyone's just hoping that everything flows smoothly. And if there's a hiccup, that's okay. Just learn from your mistakes, get back up, and keep going. Tomorrow will be a better day. <laughs> Your child is not their only student. Please remember that your teacher has many children in her care and she's trying so hard to meet every single one of their needs. And not one child is more important or less important than another. Just one child may need a little more attention at that particular moment than another child. So just remember that she's juggling a lot of things just like you are. Remember your teacher is on your team. The reason that we become teachers is because we want to help kids succeed in life. We want to give them the tools that they need 
and the skills that they need to become thriving adults, to become successful adults in life. And we might see a problem or we might see a need that maybe you don't see. And it's not because we're targeting your child. It's just because we've seen a lot of children. And this is our jobs. We are literally trained to help identify different needs. And when someone needs a little bit more scaffolding or a little more one-on-one -on -one in their lives. And we're not attacking your child. We're not attacking your parenting style. We're just trying to set everyone up for success. Number four is... Your teacher spends a lot of their own money on their class and a lot of their unpaid time on their class. So if you can be an encouragement to your teacher this year and even just a $5 gift card to Target or Amazon or Walmart or whatever, you know what? Buy her the nice whiteboard markers, the Expo markers, like the pack that comes with like all the colors, including yellow. Seriously, you will be like her favorite parent of the year. Those are the bomb. I'm telling you. Don't forget you are your child's most important teacher. I know you can sometimes send yourself on a guilt trip, dropping your kids off at school. And you know what? Your kid might say something like, I love Miss Susan. She's the best. But that's just like daggers in your heart because you wish you could spend all day with them. Just know. At the end of the day, you are their most important teacher. You are their first teacher, and you have them for the rest of your life. So while I teach them their ABCs and one, two, threes, you as the parent can reach their heart and love on them and teach them things that I never could. Raise good humans. <laughs> Lastly, we talked about clingy children at drop off. Now I just have a quick little funny story to tell you. I had a child at preschool a few years ago and he actually didn't do that bad at drop off. It was mom who had a hard time at drop off. <laughs> she she loved her her little guy so much. So she would drop him off at preschool and we would be playing outside on the playground outside. And I think she took about 10 minutes to get from her parking spot to the road because she drove at point zero 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 one miles an hour down the parking lot to get to the road. She was staring at us the whole time. Please don't be that parent. <laughs> Please just drop and go. <laughs> Give them a hug. Say, I love you. I'll be back later. Give them that reassurance and go. You're not a bad mom if they are screaming and crying as you walk out the door this is love, okay? Just drop and run, and they're going to have a great day. I promise you. I promise. I hope that this podcast episode was very informative for you. If it was, please go ahead and reach out and leave us a message at our email address and call us, leave a, a voicemail on our phone number. I would absolutely just love to hear from you. Oh, and also, if you check out our email subscriber list and you become a, a subscriber, we have a really cool printout this month. We're going to be sending out the first day of school poster that you can take a cute photo with, with your child. I designed a first day of school poster. I also designed a last day of school poster. So just print both out at the same time and use one now and store one away for later. And then you can take pictures of them on their first day of school and on their last day of school and compare them side by side. There's like a super short little questionnaire for the kids, such as like, what's their favorite color? What do they want to be when they grow up? Or something really cute like that. So go ahead and make sure that you're subscribed to our email list so that you can get your printable totally free. I made this just for you guys. So I hope that you enjoy that. And I will see you next time. Bye. Want to get in touch with the show? Email us at imperfect at podcastentertainment.com. Enjoying this show? Be sure to check out all the shows across the Podcast Entertainment Network, where there's a show for every interest. Visit www.podcastentertainment.com to browse through the full collection of shows.
Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Imperfect Moms Club.